Uh, good morning. My name is Justin Brandon. I have the privilege of chairing the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. I want to welcome you to our hearing today regarding an update on the Build It Back program. This hearing today will provide our committee with an opportunity to hear from the city's Office of Housing Recovery Operations and the Office of Management and Budget regarding the progress of the Build It Back program established after Superstorm Sandy. Our last uh, Build It Back update was in 2017, so we look forward to hearing from HRO and OMB now that the program is nearing completion. In June 2013, about seven months after Stu uh, Superstorm Sandy hit, the city announced the Build It Back program to help multifamily and single-family homeowners rebuild after Sandy. HRO administers the program with funding from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Program. According to the proposed amendment to the CDBGDR Action Plan, released this past Friday, February 7th, Build It Back is expected to cost approximately $2.65 billion. Depending on the severity of damage to the home, the program gave homeowners, renters, and landlords several options, which included repairing, repair and elevation, or rebuilding their homes, being reimbursed for work done by a contractor outside the program, or selling their property to the state or city as part of the buyout and acquisition program. More than 20,000 homeowners initially registered for Build It Back's single family program. However, after one year, only about 8,300 applicants were still in the program. Some applicants were deemed ineligible because the property was not their primary residence or they had not complied with flood insurance requirements. But many dropped out because of issues with completing the paperwork and frustrating bureaucratic delays. HRO worked to improve its customer service to better assist applicants and eventually worked out many of the problems with the program. And we commend HRO on that accomplishment. Today, 99% of all construction projects have been completed. However, many eligible homeowners who could have used assistance did not get it. And today, some homeowners are still waiting to get back into their homes. For properties that were completely destroyed or determined to be substantially damaged, the program provided a buyout and acquisition option. Properties purchased through this option were either acquired for redevelopment or will become permanent open space. Approximately 800 homes were purchased for buyout or acquisition. On September 25th, 2019, the Department of City Planning approved an application by the City Department of Housing Preservation and Development to construct resilient housing on 75 of the 141 acquired properties across Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. The other 66 lots will become permanent open space to help mitigate the impacts of future flood and rain events. We want to know what is being done with the properties purchased through the acquisition and buyout program that are not part of HPD's recent um, application, as well as why any of the properties are being redeveloped instead of being made into permanent open space for uh, further mitigation. Does it really make sense for people to move back into these areas that were destroyed during Sandy? We also want clarification regarding the costs of the program. Build It Back, which was originally allocated $1.7 billion, required $2.2 billion in 2016, and now anticipates needing $2.65 billion. The additional grant money is needed to pay contractors, close construction permits, and deal with ongoing legal issues. Recent reports also found that some homes have cost the program $700,000 to over $1 million to repair and elevate, two to three times more than the value of the existing home. And in the past year, contractors have put liens on homes for work done that has not been reimbursed by the program. Today we'd like to know why there have been such significant cost overruns and what's being done to assure homeowners that these liens will be removed as soon as possible. The committee also wants to know if the program is going to need more money to close out, and if so, how much and why will this additional money be needed? Prior Build It Back hearings have looked at the initial challenges of the program and what HRO and the city did to fix them. 
We don't want to concentrate on that uh, on to, in today's hearing. Today, the committee really wants to learn what has been done uh, since the administration last testified in 2017 and what measures and programs are currently in place for when the next storm inevitably hits. We look forward to hearing the administration's testimony today and answering our questions about the Build It Back program, the highlights of the program, as well as issues um, the applicants have experienced, such as construction delays and permitting problems. With Build It Back currently winding down, the committee would like to know if the city and HRO have an action plan for when another storm like Sandy hits. We want to know what the action plan looks like and if it really makes sense for us to keep building back in these areas or if we need to start considering other options such as managed retreat. Before we begin, I want to thank my committee staff, committee counsel Jessica Steinberg-Albin, senior policy analyst Patrick Mulville, senior finance analyst Jonathan Seltzer, and my senior advisor John Yedin for all their hard work in putting this hearing together today. Um, I will now turn the floor over to Amy Peter Peterson and Liz Greenstein from the Office of Housing Recovery Operations and Calvin Johnson from OMB. But before we do that, please raise your hands so my counsel can swear you in. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth in your testimony before this committee today and answer council members' questions honestly? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, Chair Brannon um, and um, the uh, Council of the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts and, and members. I am Amy Peterson, Director of the Mayor's Office of Housing and Recovery Operations. I'd like to acknowledge my colleague, Calvin Johnson, um, Assistant Director, Community Development Block Grant, um, Disaster Recovery at the Office of Management and Budget. He is available to join me in answering your questions. Um, thank you for inviting me to testify today. Through the city's Hurricane Sandy Housing Recovery Program, Build It Back, the city has prioritized helping homeowners remain in their affordable, long-standing waterfront communities, ensuring that these New Yorkers have the resources necessary to recover and make their homes and communities more resilient. Through its single-family program, Build It Back has helped 8,300 homeowners and landlords of one to four unit homes, housing a total of 12,500 families. Build It Back rebuilt and elevated almost 1,400 homes to today's stringent regulations for flood compliance. Approximately 250 homes have been acquired through a combination of buyout and acquisition programs, and an additional 6,650 6, homeowners with moderate sandy damage were assisted with repair and reimbursement, helping neighborhoods that were not in the FEMA 100-year floodplain when Sandy hit. We have distributed $135 million in reimbursement checks to over 6,100 families. Additionally, Department of Housing and Preservation and Development, HPD, has accelerated relief to multifamily households to date over 14,000 units across 287 developments have completed repairs or received reimbursements. Some of our hardest hit neighborhoods are now complete. Howard Beach, Hamilton Beach, Broad Channel, Breezy Point, Edgemere, Canarsie, Brighton Beach, Tottenville, Great Kills, and New Dort Beach are all construction complete. Funded by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, the Build It Back Single Family Program accounts for $2.2 billion of the total $4.2 billion post-Sandy federal CDBGDR dollars given to the city and overseen by HRO in coordination, coordination with HPD and the Department of Design and Construction. CDBGDR funds provide assistance to homeowners after all other forms of disaster assistance have been exhausted. The preliminary financial plan reflects $42 million in city funds for the initial closeout of the Build It Back Sandy single family program spread across DDC, 17.5 million, HRO, 16.8 million, and HPD, 7.7 .7 million. This additional funding will cover remaining payments for construction and other vendors and completion of disposition of acquisition and buyout properties. On Friday, the city issued an action plan amendment outlining the reallocation of $50 million in federal funding to the single family Build It Back program. Increased costs, which would be covered by these funds, include contractor insurance. Insurance programs were put in place to attract the widest pool of contractors and establish program wide safety protocols and procedures. Insurance costs, while high, provide significant benefit to the city in the form of reduced overall claim risk. Costs associated with finding the best resilient neighborhood use for properties purchased through city acquisition and buyout programs in lieu of public auction. Closeout costs for construction, management, design, and inspection, including costs related to city regulatory requirements. 
As, been as has been reported recently, some contractors be disputing payment amounts have placed liens on homes. I want to be clear that at no time has a contractor not been paid because of a funding issue. These payments are in dispute because of standard auditing practice. Placing liens on home is, is the contractor's tactic to apply pressure to the city. It is unacceptable and inappropriate for contractors to place liens on the properties of Sandy impacted homeowners. Build It Back was designed specifically so that payment obligations would run between the city and its construction managers, limiting the risk to homeowners um, during di payment disputes. As with any city contract, contractors have multiple legal remedies other than placing liens on homes and clear contractual pr procedures to dispute payments without burdening homeowners. As construction is completed and final closeout of the program continues, the city continues to focus on lessons learned. HRO is working with New York City Emergency Management, the Mayor's Office of, Resil of Resiliency, and other partners on what is required for housing recovery preparedness and how the city will respond to the next storm. I would encourage you to tour these neighborhoods if you haven't already. Two Queens neighborhoods that show the collaboration between our work and ongoing neighborhood planning and resiliency are Edgemere and Broad Channel. In Edgemere, Queens, Build It Back undertook an extensive outreach campaign to help preserve and improve the affordable and sandy-damaged housing stock in the neighborhood, focused on the elevation of attached homes. In 2016, HRO and HPD collaborated to pilot a relocation program for homeowners with substantially damaged homes in the most vulnerable portion of Edgemere's Bayfront. We worked with residents to facilitate relocation away from extreme flood hazard. The program's acquisition of storm damage property in Edgemere supports future development, open space, and coastal project protection features. A neighborhood like Broad Channel, Queens, with its multiple marshland restoration projects by DEP and Parks, street raising and resilient infrastructure projects by DDC, a new elevated and resilient school being built by SCA, a yard expansion program for neighbors of acquired properties offered by HPD, and over 250 rebuilt or elevated homes through Build It Back shows the many ways we are ensuring our coastal communities are focused on resiliency. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts for allowing me to testify here today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in 2016, um, HRO testified that the entire Build It Back program was going to be funded with the federal CDBGDR funds. Um, and HRO repeatedly assured the council that there were um, sufficient federal funding to serve everyone in the program. But in the 21 uh, preliminary budget, an additional $42 million in city funds was added. Um, can you talk about why the federal funds um, weren't enough after all? Yeah, so um, going back uh, in, into the beginning of the program, so since uh, this administration, so since 2014, we have really prioritized um, housing recovery and ensuring that our affordable longstanding communities can recover and have taken the steps to make sure that that can happen. Um, the way the program was designed was to have the, the city take on that burden and to take on the responsibility for elevating and rebuild rebuilding those homes, which is different from other models that are used um, where people give homeowners checks and then the kind of burden to figure out how to make it happen and how to, 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 to deal with additional costs that re resides on the homeowner. Um, so in doing that, um, we made the commitment we worked with our legislative partners, the senators, um, and with HUD and with everyone to ensure that we could get the funding that we needed to do that. In 26, and that happened in 2014 and into 2015. In 2016, um, when we had um, really gotten into the design and understanding what it took to elevate and rebuild these homes, um, we realized that we needed additional funds to be able to do the work to elevate the homes. In um, these coastal communities, there's a tremendous amount of work um, that needs to be done. It's kind of an urban environment, small lots. Um, uh, the, if you look at a, a map that shows the kind of communities that were hit by Sandy and the communities we're serving and the um, kind of the soil conditions in those communities, you'll see that there's a uh, tremendous need for very um, kind of strong um, foundations to ensure that you'll protect against storm surge. The building codes were updated in 2014 for um, specific requirements related to that. 
So in 2016, we added additional costs to the budget focused on um, the additional work we needed to do, adding fire protection system, resilient foundations, all of those things. We also added the cost for um, ensuring that we could pay for the homeowners um, rent when they relocated so that homeowners who did not have the financial means wouldn't um, not participate in the program because we really wanted to prioritize elevation of these communities and we really wanted to prioritize making sure that these communities remained affordable for the people who lived there, right? Which isn't always the result of a disaster recovery program. Uh, and then um, we also launched the acquisition program at that time. Uh, this, uh, the city had been uh, funneling some um, properties to the state for acquisition through the Build It Back program, but we realized that there were homes that we wanted to be able to both purchase for acquisition, um, but also purchase for buyout for kind of resilient land uses. Um, and we offered us incentives for the acquisition program to ensure that um, we understood that you might not be able to buy a new property with the funding um, based on your kind of pre-storm value. So we added um, incentives up to 150,000 to encourage more homeowners to take advantage of the acquisition program. Um, since then, we've um, kind of continued to review the budget along um, the whole program. We put a lot of things in place to ensure that we were um, keeping costs um, within kind of the, the, the cost reasonableness measure that HUD requires. Um, to ensure that we were elevating and rebuilding homes that should be elevated and rebuilt. We were buying out homes that um, where that should not happen. Um, and as we near the end of the program and the initial closeout, we continue to review the costs. And so the three things, if you look back to see what the difference in costs is that we're fo fake focused on right now, um, and you can see the difference between 2016 and now. One is the contractor insurance. So, you know, the city engaged in uh, about 5,000 construction projects, hundreds of contractors. As everyone knows, construction insurance in New York City is, is quite expensive. Um, this is in single family homes. So we put in place uh, a contractor controlled insurance program on the DDC work and it really enabled us to bring in a lot of small and MWB contractors that allowed us to put in place kind of a safety protocol ac across all of that work, but the cost um, especially just for the initial claim risk, are pretty high, and so that was an additional cost. Um, you mentioned in your testimony the acquisition of properties, so we purchased about 120 properties, the, the city, um, through the city acquisition and buyout program. We did not choose to take the route that the state took, which was to auction off those properties as is and have them rebuilt. Um, we actually went through the ULERT process and did kind of the best resilient use, whether it be affordable housing development, the yard expansion program, um, turning properties over to marshland. So those costs were in addition to what we had anticipated originally. And then I would just say the kind of the construction closeout costs when you get to the end of a project. Um, HUD requires everything to be decent, safe, and sanitary. Department of Buildings requires everything to be safe. And so the closeout process has involved additional costs associated with upgrading utilities, upgrading water mains, upgrading electrical service, even to homes that we rebuilt and then homes that were elevated often having to do work inside the home also. So that's the, that's the additional cost. Um, d does the administration anticipate um, further contributions from the city moving forward? We're continuing to review the budget and the closeout is a really complicated process. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that. I, I, I completely appreciate that this is a unprecedented undertaking. Um, I guess my concern is understanding why, or how to explain or how to account for a program that is $592 million over budget now looking for more money. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't say it's $592 million over budget. The, the way that the program works and the way that HUD action plans work is you, you understand what the initial need is and you um, are able to allocate funds towards that. And then as the need is more clearly understood, so in 2013, before anyone had any idea what it meant to elevate or rebuild homes, um, FEMA in partnership with the city did a study and so the results of that study showed that um, you didn't need all of the things that we put in place within the $500 million. So I would say that that's um, 
kind of just additional cost to actually do the work that the city committed to doing. Um, the, the, the idea that you kind of at the end of a program um, have closeout costs that, um, you know, kind of on a $2.2 billion, program, billion dollar program or less than 10% isn't something that I think is unusual in kind of a housing recovery program or, you know, kind of what you see in Build It Back is kind of what you see in a lot of capital projects just magnified in a, in a way. Um, and the, the preliminary MM MMR, um, it said approximately 800 homes had been purchased by city and state. But I think just now you said 120 homes had been purchased by the city. So were there remaining homes bought by the state? Yeah, so there's, um, and we're, we're um, reviewing like the exact numbers in partnership with the state. So the state did a buyout program on Staten Island, which I think is, you know, in terms of forward facing and really thinking about um, the future. It's something to, to really take a good look at. So the state purchased, I think about 500 properties and we can give you the exact numbers by program. 500? I think about 500 through the buyout program in Staten Island. Additionally, um, we referred uh, uh, properties to them in the initial um, two years of Build It Back for acquisition. So they purchased about, I'm going to say, again, I'll give you the exact numbers, about another $120 million, 120, not million dollars, 120 properties or so. In acquisition, the vast majority of them were auctioned off um, and are being rebuilt as uh, by private owners as um, resilient housing. And then we put in place our own acquisition and buyout program, and that um, we think is about another 120 program. So it gets you a little less than 800 now. I think we're at about 750. USDA originally anticipated purchasing properties. Um, we also have the resilient property purchase program that this city is doing for other purchases. So h how do we determine um, which homes, as far as that we have a whole new sort of housing topography here, how do we determine which is which? That which, is, which people are we putting back in their homes? Which are we looking for open space? Yeah. Manage retreat? How do, we, how do yeah. we square all that? Yeah, so I would say, um, you know, that is something that we had no understanding of, I would say, prior to Sandy and certainly in the initial years of Sandy. And so the, the move originally for, and, you know, I wasn't involved in 2013, but I think all most elected officials was, you know, get people back in their homes, rebuild their homes. And, you know, I think our commitment in every stage of this is these are, you know, longstanding communities where people have lived for generations and where first time home buyers buy homes. You know, we saw all of those, they're all different neighborhoods. You know, New York is a kind of a diverse um, city of many, many neighborhoods. And so the, in, the intention certainly is to keep these coastal communities in place. But we did learn a lot about what, where you could rebuild and not rebuild properties um, and started both uh, kind of an unbuildable process and, a and the buyout program ourselves, because we certainly wanted to be able to do that. Um, I think it's worth kind of sitting down and, and talking through some of the lessons we've, we learned through that. The Mayor's Office of Resiliency is kind of continuing that work and really thinking about what an acquisition program would look like going forward. I would say it's very, in New York City, it's not nearly as, um, you know, and I'm, you know, in, in some communities, you can say, okay, we're not going to, you know, we're going to draw a line here and we're not going to build. Um, in Edgemere, we did just that. In Edgemere, there was kind of the, the hazard risk zone where we made the decision we'd, we wouldn't rebuild, and um, we actually relocated people from that area to another area in Edgemere. But in most neighborhoods, it's, it's not as simple as that. The topography of the city and the, the way neighborhoods have been built, you can be on one side of the street and have it be kind of a park completely and the other have it be perfectly buildable. So it really, you have to look at, at the communities in partnership with the communities, I would say too. You know, these, these communities um, know the kind of daily risks that they face and understand um, where, where housing should be built and where we should consider kind of the buyout process that we went through. I'm just trying to figure out the, the top line or the overarching thing for what differentiates um, a property that's going to be dedicated open space to what's going to be redeveloped? Is there is there one? No, there's a bunch of criteria that we put in place, and I, th I think we outlined in one of our reports, and, and we can get to you. But it really looks at kind of the, the city infrastructure that supports that. Um, it looks at if it's in the 
near the blue belt if it's in a wetland. It looks at flood, flood risk, um, and it looks at other considerations in terms of whether it, 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 it's feasible to, to rebuild there. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned, um, you know, talking about contractors placing liens uh, on homes. Um, and you attribute it to the payments are in dispute because of a standard auditing practice. Can you explain the process when HUD audits the city's spending? And how, what's the yeah, holdup? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if a contractor is approved to rebuild, what happens then when the work is done that they're not getting paid? Yeah, so. So I, I think you know we, we all understand that the costs in this program are are um, something that needs to be audited and taken very seriously, and we have uh, responsibility to the city, to the taxpayers, to to HUD, to all of, to to everyone to make sure that the money we're paying is is what's due to these contractors. Um, and the contractors have been amazing. We've brought contractors in from um, kind of. You know, we have union contractors and housing, affordable housing contractors, and we have contractors from out of state who do this work other places. So we've brought in um, hundreds of contractors to actually do this work. Um, and we really worked throughout the program to advance funds, you know, to make sure the contractors were getting paid as they were doing this work and did some innovative things in, in the DDC model. There's a kind of a contractor payment fund so that um, they didn't have to wait through the long process that the city sometimes takes to release payments. So when you get to the end, you're at like 80% or 90% you've paid out to these contractors, you need to look at a lot of things, right? And so you need to make sure that they've completed the work, that there's no outstanding punch list work or large warranty work. You need to make sure that all of the permits are closed out. Um, but you also need to look at what change orders they've submitted. You need to look at what credits there are potentially that are owed, and that is a process that um, takes time on any work um, and certainly takes time on this. Um, everything is, um, as much as it's a large program, it's also a kind of a home-by-home -home program, and so that's a process that takes time um, um, to ensure that we are paying. And so we've paid up to what we are sure we can pay to the contractors and then are going through the city's process um, to ensure that we are auditing and looking at everything. And I want to be clear, you know, the, the risk is on the, the city and the contractor relationship. The homeowner's out of it. The homeowner should not be, nobody should be placing liens on the homeowners. They're, they're you know, back in their homes. That's, they, they are not responsible for the funding. Um, contractors in New York City, you know, part of doing anything in New York City is there's a, lot of, a good process in place. And so there is a three-step process. Not only does the city, our office, our, our DDC, or HPD kind of review all of the work, we have an engineering audit office that we've staffed in a way to make sure that we can do this as quickly as possible. But then if they dispute what we're agreeing to pay, they can go to the agency head, then they go to the controller, and then there's a contract dispute resolution process. They're trying to, some contractors, and uh, it's not, a lot of contractors are trying to kind of put pressure on the city to kind of release funds in advance of kind of going through all those steps. I, my concern is I saw a story on New York One uh, about a family in Coney Island who's been out of their house for four years and there's still no end date in sight. Um, so there, there's end dates in sight on all of these homes. Um, and so two different things, right? So contractors. Um, we, we have about 75 homeowners that are um, at the final stages of getting back into their homes. Um, so 75 families that are still since Hurricane Sandy not back in their home. Well, some weren't out since Hurricane Sandy because some people were back in their homes after Sandy and then moved out. But we have 75 resilient homes that we're completing. Uh, about half of those are in Sheepshead Bay Courts where we worked with the council member Deutsch and we worked with the community, we've created a homeowners associ association to ensure that um, the properties that are in the courts, which is, so they're not on a street, they're mm -hmm. kind of behind the other homes, um, have new infrastructure, because that was a huge, uh, was a huge, huge um, risk to the community, and, and it was just completely uh, made worse by Sandy, and to be able to continue to have people living there, we went through that process, and so they're getting, um, infrastructure all installed underground, and so those homeowners are in the final stages of sign-offs and completing the infrastructure hookups and all of that. 
Um, and, how many, and how many of the homes are in Sheep's Head Bay? About 30, about half of them, about 35. And the rest are where, spread um, out? Spread out. Um, so there's a bunch of kind of different reasons why homes are in the final stages. There's a few homes that needed additional water main hookups um, that went through properties that had easements and were completely complicated. Um, there's some homeowners who tried to do the work themselves, um, and we um, either kind of gave them extension after extension to allow them to do it themselves or took over the work on their behalf. And so there's a, a lot of um, kind of uh, kind of hardest issues to solve that are the ones that are remaining. Do you have an idea of how many homes have liens on them from the contractors? So about 90 homes had liens placed on them, and 30 of those have been lifted already. Okay. And again, that's an unacceptable practice. We reach out to all the homeowners. Um, so why do you, I, I, you said that a few times, I understand, but why, why is that, why are the contractors doing that then? If they have other legal recourse, why is that the one that they go for? Is that the one that, that you guys... The one that gets the attention. But how come the, all right, but then how come the other things don't get attention? But they do get attention. We're going through the steps to pay the contractors, um, and we're... But I feel like the contractors wouldn't be doing the liens if they felt the other stuff got your attention. Uh, the contractors have been working closely with us to close the liens and to um, get paid the amount. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough situation. I mean, I hear from the contractors, too. I want the contractors to get paid. I also want the people to get back in their homes. But it all has to go through you guys, right? Yeah, I mean, this is an important – the, the Build-It-Back program – um, is unprecedented, right? And it was set up in a way yep. that we didn't give the money to the homeowners to do the work themselves. Um, you see in those instances where contractors go bankrupt and people can't even like sue the contractors, right? So you can see examples across other housing recovery efforts of what the risks are associated with that. Um, we wanted to minimize the risk to the homeowners and to the contractors and to the city certainly. Um, by taking on that responsibility, by ensuring that we're um, going through the process to make sure that what we are paying is what they are owed, um, and that we're being responsible in auditing what the final payments will be to these contractors. So what are, what are some of the, I mean, I guess my concern too is that it now not only is the homeowner waiting to get back into their house um, for something that is a distant memory to most people, but now their credit screwed up. I mean, you know, having a lien paste on your home is a real is not uh, an easy thing. Yes, yeah, so but, I'm, I'm but I'm trying to figure out what are the other legal recourses that are the contractors. Is that their last resort, placing a lien? What else have can they do to get your attention before that? So the way the city's contracting process works is they have multiple <laughs> recourses, right? So we agree. Um, to pay them for the work that is complete, and we do, and we, they're fully paid for that. We then have to review at the end of the job the change orders or credits and everything that's due. We have an engineering audit team that does that. You know, one of the things that is good about this project and this program is there's a lot of eyes on it, right? So it's really important that... So the change it, orders aren't approved as it goes along? They are, but at the at the end is when kind of... You might have been saying to the contractor all along that you're not going to get paid for this, or at the end, um, you kind of make those determinations. The contractor then has the ability to say, okay, I have an agreement, that's fine. Or the contractor can um, do ask for an agency head determination, so that's the first step. So then the agency head, um, depending on which agency it is, it's either DBC or myself or HPD, um, reviews what happened and makes an agency head determination. And this is... This isn't like this isn't unusual to build it back. This is what any contractor can do on any city capital project. Um, and then there's a claim process. So you send the claim to the controller's office. We've had that happening all along, right? We've had that happening back on our case management contracts and on our environmental contracts and other contracts throughout. Then the controller goes through that process and reviews the claim. And then if they're still not paid what they think they're owed and they haven't been successful in convincing anyone along the way, there's even a contractor dispute resolution board where they can take the dispute. So there's multiple ways to dispute how much they're being paid. Mm. Um, I know it's been reported Build It Back has spent significantly more to repair and elevate homes than the homes are worth. 
I know there was a story about a home in Staten Island that was elevated and repaired. It cost the program um, more than 770000 even though the home was valued at most 275000 do, do we have an understanding of why it's costing close to a million dollars to fix these homes? Yeah, so I would say, um, most importantly, our priority has been to the homeowners and the communities and the people who live there, right? And so you can, you can take the approach that you're going to um, only, only invest in homes that are worth a lot of money or that you are not going to invest the money that you need into every person's home. But we took the approach that we wanted the people who lived in these longstanding and affordable communities to be able to stay in these longstanding and affordable communities and keep them affordable, keep the homeowners who live there there, um, not have it turn into a place where only millionaires can come and like develop coastal homes, right? So um, to do that, um, you have to do the same thing for every house, right? Whether it's an old beach bungalow or whether it's a, you know, a, a a much nicer developed home, you still have to take the steps to elevate the home and ensure that it will be protected from the risks that we now face in these communities. The biggest one and the, the, the kind of highest cost is the storm surge and ensuring that the foundations um, are, are protect against that. And I would say that, you know, um, if you look at the value of properties in these communities, I, I don't think you can buy property for two hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars either. I mean, these are these are communities that, just like anywhere in New York City, there's value. Do you, do you know the home I'm talking about? I don't know which one, but we okay. can we can get back to you soon. I mean, can you give me an idea or, or an example of an elevation that had average costs versus higher costs? I, I understand this is all unprecedented. Just trying to figure out how one elevation goes according to plan, and the next one is two times as much as the house is worth? Um, so I would say that, you know, the, so, so one, a lesson learned is whether you should elevate or rebuild or do a modular program and what you should do with these properties. And so um, we certainly move towards the modular program and in terms on, of the impact on the community, um, there's a much less impact on the community. In elevating a home, um, and sometimes elevation is, is kind of still less than rebuilding, you, you are basically lifting a home um, that, and you don't, you don't know what, as much as you can do kind of some investigative stuff, you have no idea kind of what's under the home and you have no idea the work that needs to be done within the home to bring it up to code. So certainly some of our earlier elevations um, should have been rebuilt, should have gone through the modular program and that's something that I think in terms of really focusing on future storms, fo focusing on mitigation pre-future storms, it's really to think about what's the best way to, to, to prepare these communities and these homes. Um, and so then once you kind of lift the home, you're, you basically understand more of what's going on with the, the property itself and the home itself and the structure of the home. So some homes, you, we literally needed to kind of rebuild the home in the air um, and again, we got much better at understanding kind of that difference. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of dewatering at the site and things that need to happen to be able to install the foundations and then the foundations themselves. Homes um, in all of these neighborhoods are in fire districts. So depending on when you elevate them and you have the, the specific height, you need to put um, sprinklers and fire protection in the homes. Um, many of the homes, um, because of the strapping and other things, once you're kind of lifting it, you understand you need a new roof and you need new siding, um, and there's a lot of work that goes into kind of upgrading the home with, within the home. Um, in relation to uh, property tax obligations, what impact do um, these repairs have on a homeowner's property tax bill? Okay, I am not the expert in that, um, and Department of Finance, and we can get back to you, but there was, uh, and again, not the expert, but there was a local law that was passed for people who were impacted by Sandy that their, the work that we did to upgrade their homes and make them more resilient and rebuild them would not um, uh, impact their property tax. Um, there were some questions about that and people who um, think that it has impacted should certainly call Department of Finance, reach out to Department of Finance about that. 
Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, uh, Councilman Casa Constantinidis, is here. Um, getting back to the auditing, you know, the city has said that there's an engineering auditing office that, that well, you just mentioned too, that it's got to review each piece of work for the homes um, in every stage of the way, certainly the most important part when it's done and ready to be signed off on. But my understanding is that the staff has five people working there for the entire city. Is that true? No, no. Um, there's an engineering audit office at HRO, um, which had more than five before. We recently um, brought more resources in. It had about, I would say, like 12 um, previously. We brought in more resources, and we've also um, added resources at DDC. So there's, we can get you the exact count of staff. I'm just worried. And that that's just one part of the process, right? So there's the construction team that reviews what happened and meets with the contractors and talks about that. There's a payment audit review team, and then there's the engineering audit office, and that's a, that's a requirement of the controller and the, the city of New York for all capital projects. I'm just trying to figure out why there might be such a backlog. I know that there's people told us there's backlogs of payments going back to 2016. We have the resources to do that, and we expedite all payments. Um, Costa, you okay? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give it to Costa. Thank you, Chair Brennan. Um, so, I'm not sure if this question has been asked already, but you know we are you know, still seven and a half, seven plus years later, uh, dealing uh, with the impacts of Sandy, which have been uh, so. so devastating for the families involved. Uh, what are we thinking about uh, if another storm hits? You know, how do we, and displaces families and, and sort of uh, puts families in a, in a very similar place, which, you know, is because climate change is, is pre you know, it, we're living in climate change and that could potentially happen. We have to sort of be planned for the next one. How do we sort of thinking through how we would deal, what, what, have we, what lessons have we learned here, what can we sort of think about for the next time around, if, if God forbid there is one, we hope that there isn't, but we have to be prepared. And so how do, how do we sort of structure a, a, a process differently next time that would work a little bit more seamlessly? Yeah, so thank you, um, and thank you for, for um, that question. It's incredibly important um, to, to all of us who've been doing the Sandy work, to the communities who've been engaged in it since, since Sandy hit, um, to make sure that all of the lessons we've learned, and we've learned a lot of lessons, are carried forward in planning for the future and in understanding what um, to do better. And we've um, had a, a lot of work um, that we're doing towards that goal. Um, we've been working closely with New York City Emergency Management, and the mayor's <coughs> office of resiliency and city hall and other partners to really talk about this and um, also kind of on the ground in the communities talking to people about things. I would say the priorities are around three goals for me. One is to maximize resources to homeowners. If um, if you look at who was served by Build It Back um, and who did not need Build It Back. Um, you know, if you're, if you have the right insurance, and I know flood insurance is an issue, but if you have re access to resources, um, you're better able to, to respond. So for us, prioritizing both the work that Mayor's Office of Resiliency is doing on reforming flood insurance is really important, but for us, it's about making sure that homeowners get flood insurance. Um, and really pushing that, we did an ad campaign around the last um, hurricane <coughs> season to really focus on people in our coastal communities and to make sure they get that. And I would encourage you and us to figure out ways to make sure that is the best piece. And if you got federal, uh, federal benefit after Sandy and you don't have flood insurance, you won't be eligible for any federal benefits in the future. So it's, it's even more important than just being prepared on your own. So um, everyone knows that after Sandy, what happened to SBA loans? Should I get them? Shouldn't I get them? And I'm advantaged or disadvantaged. There's been a lot of work legislatively since then in future storms about what SBA loans impact will have on future benefits. But that's something that we all need to have a clear, both understanding what's going on in the federal government and a clear uh, plan for what the city wants to put in place moving forward. And we're, we're working on on that, we're working in partnership with 
other impacted um, communities like Texas and Florida and Louisiana, everyone's facing this and they face it more regularly in terms of how to make the federal benefits work. The other piece is kind of the ongoing mitigation and resiliency and making sure that the, the questions that I was just asked about what it means to elevate a home, the questions I was just asked about buyout versus acquisition, um, the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and City Planning and all of our partners are really thinking about kind of long-term um, acquisition programs and ways to ensure that, you know, kind of in, in Houston, they have an ongoing acquisition program that's in place. A storm happens and they're able to ramp that up using federal dollars. That's exactly what we're working towards here. Um, but also ensuring that when we're doing sustainability work, right, we're installing fuel pumps in people's homes, that that's being done in a resilient way. Um, one of the, the things that happened after Sandy was rapid repairs. That's an incredibly important uh, program that we put in place in partnership with FEMA using um, STEP funding, um, FEMA PA funding. That is something that right now FEMA is saying they will not do again. That is a huge risk to the city. Um, if that's not allowed, it's something we did and then other places did. It's the, the best way to provide shelter in place for people in an urban community. So that's something that we should be working in partnership with FEMA. Um, and then additionally, it's about operational readiness and making sure that the expertise and the staff and the people that we um, that we developed internally and the expertise in the communities with our community partners isn't lost and making sure that that carries forward. And do we have enough resources? Because I mean, we saw the IPCC report, the, you know, even the federal government's own report that they tried to hide the day after Thanksgiving last year um, while we were digesting our turkey. They were trying to, you know, they it released that report. Even our city's own report talks about um, the possibility of certain neighborhoods uh, being possibly wiped from the map in the next 50 to 75 years. How do we, what are the conversations are we having around those very frightening realities? And like, how are we, in, you know, do we have enough staff to sort of work on these issues to sort of combat those really serious resiliency challenges? Yeah, I would say that the city has really committed to both um, use the, the, the kind of, the use the disaster of Sandy to both really think about housing recovery and recovery operations, but then resiliency moving forward, and has really built out a strong team across multiple agencies. I mean, city planning did their neighborhood resilience studies, certainly the mayor's office of resiliency, but across all agencies really thinking about this. Um, so, um, you know, we are, we are working to ensure that that this is, in, you know, kind of included in every part of city government, and really focused on ensuring that the expertise that we now have related to recovery, specifically, not talking about resiliency, but recovery specifically, is, you know, kind of part of the city fabric moving forward. Thank you, Chair Brennan. Thank you, Chris. Um, one of the things that is concerning is, I, I understand that, unfortunately, no. Um, area of our government is immune to bureaucratic morass. Um, but I, under, I can understand when there's delays or there's, there's hang-ups with building a new school, building a new park, you know, putting in um, a new playground or something. Like, you know, people just have to kind of grin and bear it and wait. But, but to sort of shrug our shoulders and say, well, you know, this happens when, when it comes down to someone getting back into their home seems, it just seems really, really callous. And I don't know, I, I guess my concern is that be, the further and further away Sandy gets, the further away it is in our rearview mirror, the more the people aren't even thinking about that there could be some people who are still looking to get back into their homes. What are we doing so that the bureaucratic mess that we deal with with parks and schools and all this stuff is is sort of not happening here when it comes to getting people back into their home. I can understand, you know, I have to tell people in my district if, if we're building a playground, I'll be lucky if the playground is built by the time the kids are in college, right? That's one thing. But, but when we're talking about getting people back into their homes, it seems like there should be a different level of empathy and urgency. 
Um, so our commitment has always been for the homeowners. Our commitment has always been for these communities and for ensuring that these people are safe in their homes. And so any work that we're continuing to do to get people returned to their home is to make sure those homes are safe um, and they'll be protected from the future storm um, and that they're able to stay in their communities, right? So, you know, we have a committed group of people who work daily to cut through whatever the last thing is that needs to happen. But to be clear, you know, um, upgrading someone's water supply to ensure that they have the ability to um, have the sprinkler system that they need to protect their home and doing that through kind of neighboring properties and easements is a complicated process that we develop, devote all of our resources to on a daily basis to make it happen. We have you know, kind of a team at the Department of Buildings. We have an expedited process at BSA. We've worked really hard to make sure that all of this happens and all of this happens for the homeowners. Um, kind of on the flip side of what you would call callous, the, some of the homeowners who are finishing are people who, you know, some programs, and we were told kind of early on, you have to kind of say no. If they can't get X done by X day, you say no. We said, okay, you wanted to build this home on your own and you couldn't build this home on your own. Um, we will now build it for you. Um, so we have actually taken extra steps in every part of this program um, to make sure that we finish the work and finish the work for the homeowners. And if you look at our program compared to other disaster, re disaster recovery programs where you just send out a check or you just um, allow people to try to figure this out on their own, that's not what we're saying. We're saying we're gonna do everything we can regardless of if whatever's happening in your property had anything to do with Sandy, but it has something to do with us making sure you get returned to a safe home. We will do that work and that is what we were doing. What what do you think is is the biggest lesson we've learned for when the next Sandy comes? How would would we do this again? And if we did, how would we do it differently? Okay, so that's a big. Uh, there's a, a lot of lessons learned, um, and I think that uh, you know it's incredibly important to ensure that people who are living in coastal communities can make decisions for themselves about whether they want to stay in those coastal communities and whether or not they can return to safe housing. And obviously, as you mentioned, there's kind of some places where that is kind of impossible, but um, what we've found after Sandy and what we you know, believe is these are important coastal communities we need to return people to. Um, the program as designed was designed um, uh, pre-me, um, pre this administration, after Sandy with this idea towards kind of uh, one size fits all, you come in, you apply, we'll look at what's going on and, and, and help you recover. That's not the answer. There were two vastly different groups of people who were impacted by Sandy. There were people who had flooding in their basement. There were people who never had flooding before and had damage. Those people needed the resources to be able to do the work themselves. And we developed a lot of programs along the way, the reimbursement program, the direct grant program, to allow um, working with nonprofits, to have nonprofits do repairs for people who can do it themselves. So there's a whole process and a program that needs to be developed for, th for those people, and there will be those people again. Um, and then there's people who have substantial damage to their home, um, and there's a lot of lessons learned in terms of how you better kind of understand who those people are and respond to their individual needs, how you look at communities and work on the ground with communities. The biggest lesson I learned when I first got here was that this all needed to be done from the community in partnership with the local elected officials. We were in everyone's office by hearing what they wanted to have happen. The kind of first year I was here, I went to every community and heard things and every single community wanted something different. Every single community had a different need and you need to be able to adapt the program to respond to what the community needs and it needs to be kind of built out of the community. But there's a lot more there. I'm happy to kind of talk um, and meet with you guys to really talk about the lessons learned. And we're already doing that with kind of other elected officials and community groups. H how are we balancing sort of the program winding down? Uh, it's, it's an interesting moment here because the program is winding down and, and preparing to close out. But at the same time, the people that are still, you know, we're now dealing with the, the handful of folks who are still waiting, which is really could be argued the most important. 
It is the most important. No question. It's so, the most important. Are, like, are, are we down to bare bones skeleton crew at this point? No, I mean we're we're a much smaller staff than we were in in our peak, but we still have a, a large staff. We've we've adapted throughout this program based on what the need of the program. So while we've increased staffing for auditing and payments and all the contract closeout stuff, we still have our core team of construction people, we still have our core team of customer service, and we still have the people who are really working every day to 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 get those homeowners home and to to make sure we can close out the HUD grant and then to really think about the future. The people that are still waiting, do they have one point of contact that they deal with? Generally, yes. Um, when, when does the program have to be fully closed out? So the funding for the program ends in September 2022. Um, you know, HUD closeout is something that is a complicated process. Um, we've closed about out about 10% of our um, work, but I think that, you know, kind of the, the, the administrative tail for a $2.2 billion as part of a $4.2 billion um, HUD grant is a, is a process that goes on. Is there any, is there any um, support given, I'm, I'm assuming homeowners have asked for it, but is there any support or anything that the administration can offer for homeowners who might be worried that the liens are going to ruin their credit? Yeah, so we have um, reached out to each of them individually, and we have legal counsel lien to talk to them if there's an issue that they have. I have 2018 here as well. I, I guess I want. I just. I, I want to finish on um, preparing for you know for when the next Sandy is going to hit, um, and some of the what, what some of the things we may have learned. I mean, the contractors that we picked um, for elevating the homes, were, were they picked because they had prior experience in doing this? So did we consider prior experience before we awarded bids? So, um, we have, a, a engaged with a vast, vast group of contractors, right? There aren't a lot of home, single home, fa family home builders in New York City, right? So we had, uh, working with us, a group of people who, um, were kind of single family home builders, we added through the Department of Design and Construction in partnership with the Building and Construction Trades uh, Project Labor Agreement to vastly expand the contractor pool. We did attract um, a lot of contractors who had done work previously in Texas and Louisiana and other places. So kind of we, we ended up with a really good combination of people who knew the three things we needed to know, right? How you do work with the city, how you do single family housing work in these communities, and how you do kind of um, resilient housing in disaster recovery. So we ended up with a lot of different kind of partnerships among groups that focused on ensuring they had all of that knowledge. And we do, you know, to, to kind of think moving forward, one of the things that's important is to how we don't lose that contractor base, the um, work that HPD is doing with their um, resilient properties for affordable housing is kind of going to continue some of that work moving forward. I know the um, New York Rising program that was used on Long Island, the average cost of elevations was $175,000. Build it back costs nearly three times this amount. Do we have an idea why? So the, the program that you're talking about is one of the programs where they gave money to contractors, to, to homeowners to do the work. And so they're paying for the kind of uh, the, the, the simple part of the elevation, which is kind of lifting the home and some work related to the foundations. Um, we do the full work that's required. So they're not paying for any upgrades you need to do within the home. They're not paying for um, replacing the siding and the roofing and all of the things that need to happen. Additionally, um, working in the city is a much more kind of dense urban environment is an understatement for these communities. And so just the complications of working in these communities and the work that needs to happen. Also, you know, I think that in other places they've struggled with what building code requirements are and things like that and um, have struggled to um, get permits closed and things like that. You know, 
while we have a very uh, strong building code, which is incredibly important if you're going to be building, um, we also have one that's consistent across the city, but there's costs associated with ensuring that we can comply with the building code. So considering this was, you know, an unprecedented storm, an unprecedented program, um, aside from the people who got back into their homes, d does anyone consider build it back a success? So I think when you look at housing recovery, disaster housing recovery programs, this is a model that other places are looking at in terms of how you work in a dense urban environment, how you preserve affordable communities for the people who live there, how you balance the um, needs of having people who want to do it themselves through like a direct grant or a reimbursement, um, the modular program, how you come in and do innovative things. So I think there's a lot of things that we've done with our program that are lessons learned for both New York City but for other people who are facing this sort of disaster. And we've worked in partnership with other groups to kind of talk about the, the lessons we've, lear we've learned and the things we've done. Um, yes, I mean, I'd love to talk to you more offline about I mean, I'm assuming there's a checklist of, of things we would do differently next time. Yeah. Um, yes. And I think um, a lot of us like to, you know, we, we use the phrase, it's not if, but when. But really understanding that it is when yeah. the next one's going to happen, knowing how we would do this differently, I think would be, would be very helpful. Um, you know, keeping in mind that telling someone who, who is still waiting to get back into their home from a storm that people barely remember um, Telling them that this was an unprecedented thing doesn't doesn't give them much solace, right? I think we both agree on that. Um, this is it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Okay, we we'll call up the first panel: uh, Marcy Benstock from Clean Air, and Christine Apa from NYLPI. Okay, just say your name and then start whenever, whoever wants to go first. Greetings, Chairman Brennan. My name is Christine Appa and I'm a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. New York Lawyers for the Public Interest appreciates the opportunity to present testimony at this oversight hearing. We are here to share our views on the importance of bolstering preparation in environmental justice communities for severe weather events and to offer some ideas on how to better assist these communities in the rebuilding process. NILPI works to alleviate the disproportionate impact of environmental burdens on lower income communities and communities of color across the city. A significant part of NILPI's work focuses on preventing and mitigating the effects of climate change on environmental justice communities. NILPI has also served an integral role in the campaign that passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. We have participated in workshops to support communities and neighborhoods that have been in adversely impacted by severe weather events like heavy storms and extreme heat. We have also worked on issues that affect homes in the aftermath of storms like mold and limited accessibility for people with disabilities. Overall, we believe that supporting communities well in advance of severe weather events is the most effective way to mitigate the damage and put neighborhoods back on the road to recovery. My testimony today will focus on community organizing as part of the Resiliency Planning Toolkit. 
Seven years and three months ago, Superstorm Sandy bore down on the east coast of the United States. The storm was the fiercest that many had ever experienced. I'm a native New Yorker, and I had recently started practicing law at the time. And I can truly say that it really shaped my view of how to work with communities and the importance of a community lawyering and getting results for people. It cost precious lives and community integrity and billions of dollars in damage. It made apparent the dire need for resiliency planning for everyone, not just major cities, but in every town and neighborhood. The pace of a community's recovery is easily correlated with the availability of resources. Communities that were able to buy food ahead of time, use technology to back up important documents, and even relocate ahead of the severe weather event were in the best position to begin and complete recovery efforts. Communities that had already began with limited resources and reduced access to reliable and accessible infrastructure spent years navigating the complex recovery landscape. This was apparent as most of New York City went back to business in a relatively shorter time after the storm. But the most affected and vulnerable communities did much to rebuild themselves back through support systems that grew organically from networks of civic organizations and local leadership. These local grassroots support systems were integral to their unique recovery processes. The city can foster greater resiliency in these communities by supporting the continuation and development of these informal, locally rooted networks. The city should connect with and designate a core of community organizers, local houses of worship, civic associations, and local organizations that can help make the information on resiliency and the recovery processes available to families long before severe weather events. The Lower East Side Long-Term Recovery Group is a helpful example of a core group of local organizations that form to facilitate the discovery disaster recovery process among neighbors. The city can use this as a model for other neighborhoods to help connect people before and during their time of need. Waiting until the aftermath of a storm to establish these connections wastes valuable time and can increase the time it takes for families to navigate the city's programming. This is particularly important for New Yorkers with disabilities. The city should also consider outreach to support minority-owned small businesses that were instrumental in providing resources and access in the immediate aftermath. Studies of the city's funded responses have revealed several layers of management issues. The city controller, for example, issued a report in 2015 showing that the city's Build It Back program suffered from various financial and administrative issues. The city should also aim to pre establish procedural clarity and offer primers to homeowners and renters on its available assistance programs to establish community partners in the months prior to hurricane season and at the start of winter. We also suggest that the city gather census information to ensure adequate language access. New York City's great public information infrastructure helps keep people aware of various city-sponsored programs and policies. The city must continue in its efforts to obtain maximum participation in the upcoming census to ensure that we have an accurate accounting of the city's population and can also be well-versed in preparing language access programs. This is critical in environmental justice communities as it will help the city to properly deploy resources, including adequately translated forms and interpreters. The city should also endeavor to liaise with the Department of Cultural Affairs with the city's Office of Long-Term Sustainability Planning to create culturally relevant programming around the topics of climate change and disaster preparedness. We also um, encourage the city to create jobs that would help to promote resiliency um, focused infrastructure Environmental justice communities can also benefit from increased access to job training that helps to support more sustainable neighborhoods. The goal of resiliency planning should also be to help communities to reduce joblessness and to promote stable wages that are essential to help people to withstand the financial stresses that severe weather events cause on families. In conclusion, NILPI looks forward to working with the City Council and the administration to strengthen resiliency planning for environmental justice communities located on the waterfront and throughout the city to ensure a safe and sustainable future for all of its residents. Thank you. Thank you. You can, you can begin when you're ready. Just make sure your mic's on. Oh, can you hear me? It's so cold. 
There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm Marcy Benstock, Director of Clean Air Campaign. Friends of the Earth joins us in four last points at the end. Um, some Build It Back and other funds are being misallocated to in-water projects offshore. The Council should end this whenever these funds help subsidize new development at the worst possible disaster-prone locations offshore, especially in the Lower Hudson River. The stretch of the Hudson River up to West 59th Street is a designated top-risk hurricane evacuation zone. The water in this habitat is also one of the most important marine habitats on the whole Atlantic coast. That means everything possible should be kept out of these near shore waters as the Federal Clean Water Act requires, including both real estate development sites and so-called resiliency projects. Spending significant Build It Back or other funds on redevelopment or resiliency projects in the Hudson River would create potentially catastrophic public safety, environmental, financial, and other risks. Risks that are, that are completely avoidable if the council insists that available funds be spent on more essential high priority projects. Pier 76 is a good example of both good and bad spending proposals. Funding Sandy related roof, boiler and electrical repairs for the city's tow pound on Pier 76 makes sense for now at least until the Category 5 hurricane that the Lower Hudson River is overdue for hits the river. Spre Streetsblog.com explained why forcing the tow pound off of Pier 76 too soon would be ill-advised. Spending far more at Pier 76 to subsidize um, the alternative some people support Push, is subsidizing a high-end office building, a hotel, or other non-water-dependent uses would not make sense. That would put thousands of people in harm's way for the 157 mile an hour winds or higher that come with Category 5 hurricanes. It would hasten the piecemeal destruction of a prime fisheries habitat of immense national importance in the lower Hudson River. And it would risk saddling New York taxpayers with billions of dollars worth of storm and hurricane damage and liability costs for something that's not even there now. Habitat threatening coastal resiliency projects should also be ruled out when they're in the water. Some projects being marketed as resiliency would not in fact work, and most would be environmentally destructive if they're sited in the water. Better spending alternatives include replacing defective NYCHA boilers, not just with temporary boilers, but good permanent ones, and expanding optional buyout programs for disaster-prone areas with the sites maintained as open space in perpetuity. There's a night and day difference between land and water. It's much more costly, risky, and destructive to build in the water. Experts say the only measure that has proved 100% effective for minimizing harm to people and property in coastal areas is shifting new development away from the water. Subsidizing development not just along the water, but right in it, moves in exactly the wrong direction. The 1972 Clean Water Act, the federal law, was enacted in part to safeguard public waterways for navigation and for sustaining fisheries and other living marine resources. U.S. District Court decisions on the Westway case reaffirmed this. The very same policy that would keep the most people out of harm's way in the lower Hudson River 
is the policy that would uphold the Clean Water Act by keeping habitat altering development and, quote, resiliency, unquote, projects out of the river. We urge the Council to respect the Federal Clean Water Act and protect and preserve the nearshore habitat in the Lower Hudson River when considering disaster prevention policies and public spending priorities. We'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who wants to testify? Okay. Thank you both very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and with that, we are adjourned.